Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, May 18th, and uh, we're going to first uh, just do an update on S7, a bill regarding to expungement, uh, which is up for action today. And then we will turn to H183, um, a bill regarding um, sexual assault. And uh, our question there will be whether or not to concur with the Senate proposal of amendment. So in, in terms of uh, S3, I was surprised when it came up for, for action because I had, uh, or saw it on the, actually saw it on the action calendar today because my understanding was that it was gonna be going to appropriations and there was some back and forth with the clerk and the speaker and appropriations, mm -hmm. um, which I'm is- I'm sorry, Maxine, to interrupt you, but I, you said S3, do you mean S7? Yep. I do. Thank you. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, and so after some back and forth, it it um, it, it seemed as, as you saw what happened, best to postpone action at least until this afternoon so uh, could figure out if the bill um, in fact needed to go to go to appropriations. Uh, there is a fiscal note for the um, for S7. It has been posted on our website. I um, did speak with our liaison, Representative Trevor Squirrel from Appropriations um, during the lunch hour. And he informed me that last week um, they, uh, they did look at S7. I had sent him both the more expanded bill as well as the, uh, the bill that we voted out on Friday and we'll be reporting on the floor. And, uh, and Representative Squirrel reached out to the state's attorneys and to the judiciary and um, was told that they don't know what the impact would be. Um, however, their understanding is that given the, the uh, relief money that, um, that is coming, that the Senate proposed that we reviewed as a committee, that they think that um, that, that will help. And so they did not request any additional funds at that time and thought it'd be best to wait and see. And perhaps for um, budget adjustment, you know, if there was something needed at that time, then they could come back but that there wasn't um, anything needed. And so appropriations uh, does not need to have, have the bill. Um, there is a um, question about the surcharge piece of the bill that uh, my understanding was that was more like a technical fix. And uh, I've been working with Bryn, who's been working with uh, JFO to, to try to understand that. But regardless of that, again, um, According to House Appropriations, they do not need the bill. Um, they are not concerned about the fiscal note and any needs at this point, and it can be revisited uh, if needed during bu budget adjustment. So that's that's where we are. Um, Selena's reporter, do you want to do you want to add anything? Um, no, just uh, you know, just trying to make sense of some of what came up in the fiscal no kind of in the final hour but I think you summarized really well and um it's it's helpful to I appreciate Maxine all the work you've done this morning just to keep kind of looping back around with the appropriations committee and really do some very serious due diligence to make sure we didn't need, they didn't need to weigh in on the bill um and also really appreciate that um there will be an opportunity to visit this or revisit it as needed and in budget adjustment if it turns out the the that there are you know significant new costs that that can't that won't be covered through other funding sources in this year's budget thank you thank you so much and and we did not hear any concerns from testimony uh in terms of in terms of more more funding needed. And the fiscal note is interesting that DMV noted that DMV can absorb um, any costs within their, within their current budget. And that um, also was noted by the Appropriations Committee. So given that, Selena, you can let me know either, either now or afterwards whether or not you're, you're ready to take it up later so I can let the speaker know. Yeah, I think we could. I think we can. I'm definitely ready to report and just wanted, you know, wanted to make sure we had closed all the loops on that. But I feel prepared to move forward at this point. If you do, <laughs> and the committee does. I do. Thank you. Uh, any 
Questions from committee members on S7 before we turn to H183. Bob. Yes, <clears throat> I'm a little confused. I thought that we had voted this out and it was going to the, the summer summer committee or, or whatever to go through the, the, uh, the defenses once again. So a few points of clarification. We, we did vote it out. There is a section in the bill that does uh, refer to the Justice Oversight Committee and things that we have asked the Justice Oversight Committee to uh, consider. However, there is the remaining part of the bill regarding um, civil expungements um, uh, from DMV and Judicial Bureau. And that, that part um, did pass and that is what for the most part, um, Selena will be will be reporting on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Don't see anybody else. So Michelle, Childs, <coughs> okay. Good afternoon. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, committee members, H one eighty three. I. Don't know if we have formally received it, but I think it will be possibly on notice in the House calendar tomorrow. There's always a possibility that things we may be asked uh, for rule suspension and to take things up off of the notice calendar. So I did want us to be prepared to answer the question um, whether or not we should concur with uh, Senate proposals of amendment. We did uh, review it last week. Michelle did walk us through it but I would like her to uh, do it again. And we, um, and we do have witnesses uh, to help us make that decision. Uh, I will say um, from the get-go that I'm um, pleased with the work that the, uh, that the Senate did. And uh, I will be recommending that we concur. Uh, but with that, let's first listen to the Michelle and, and the testimony. So go ahead, Michelle, thank you. Sure. So, uh, so is it, your preference, I'll just walk through the the Senate proposal of amendment and talk to you about the, the kind of big substantive changes, maybe not some of the little language changes. Is that all right? And then uh, that's fine. And, and I'm sorry I didn't mention that for folks who are watching that uh, both as past the House and as past the Senate are on our um, committee website. Uh, so thank you, Michelle. The, the Senate won't be because we haven't gotten that from the Senate Secretary's office yet because it passed on Friday and then it's held for a day. And um, so we haven't gotten the integrated version and there were the floor that brought the council back in, but you probably have the, um, the various amendments and then we should have those and those should be up for folks, hopefully some, tomorrow if we get them from the Secretary's office tomorrow. Um, right. Yeah. Thank you. So, so last week we looked at draft 1.1, 1. 1, uh, which was um, from the Senate Judiciary Committee, and and then um, Senator Lyons' committee that was, um, I mean, amendment that was passed on the floor. So, right. Yep. So, so that those are on our, our website. Thank you for thank you for yes. that correction. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, first section is your definition section in Chapter 72 uh, with respect to sexual assault and your two definitions being consent and incapable of consenting. The Senate kept your definition of incapable of consenting, didn't change anything there. Um, but in the definition of consent, as we've already discussed, there were some changes. So, the House had a, that it had to be voluntary and knowing, and Senate changed it to consent means the affirmative, unambiguous, and voluntary agreement to engage in a sexual act, which can be revoked at any time. And I think we've already discussed, they, they did spend a lot of time on this one section. They chose to go with some language from Oklahoma statute. Um, we're not aware of any constitutional challenges to that language or any particular concerns that have come up in Oklahoma with respect to that, um, just a little background. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to discuss things or if you just want me to walk through them or. Um, I, I, think it, I think it would be helpful if, um, if you gave us your legal opinion on whether or not the, um, this new language increases the state's burden. Just a little bit more. Right. more um, so in my view, it doesn't. I mean, I think in some ways it's, it's uh, it 
provides a little more clarity um, by saying it has to be affirmative and ambiguous and voluntary. So you have voluntary already in yours. Um, if it's not all three of those, then there's not consent. Um, so, uh, so let's say if, you know, if, if you're missing one of those things, I would say maybe if something was uh, ambiguous, then there's no consent. So it, I, I, I don't think it, um, I think, did you ask the question about whether or not it increases the burden on prosecution? Um, in my view, it, it does not. Um, so. Okay. So thank you. Before you move on, any questions, Bob? I'm assuming that your hand is up from before, but committee members, any questions for Michelle? Because that, that really is pretty much the, the only new there's, there's a little bit else, you know, in terms of what the Sentencing Commission will look at, but that really is the operative section that we understand here. Okay, go ahead, Michelle, thank you. Sure. Um, so moving on to section two, they didn't make any changes to section two. That's kind of the heart of the, of the sexual assault statute with the elements in there, and they didn't change anything in section two. And section three, this is um, where it spells out more uh, in depth around what does not constitute consent. And the change here was, was minimal. Um, they did eliminate one thing that you had in the house version, which is, um, sorry, I'm having to toggle back and forth between the two, is that you had an additional subdivision in there that said an expression of lack of consent through words or conduct means there is no consent. They removed that um, and then they just went back to existing language on subdivision one. Um, and other than that, it is the same. Um, they made a little tweak also to the, um, the reference to the rape shield law, but again, substantively, it's not, it's not any different. So next section in the judiciary amendment is the data Reporting. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I, can, just going back, can you just, because um, I'm reporting the bill, could you just call my attention to the um, Reap Shield reference change? Yep. If you're looking in the Senate version, you're looking at 3254 subdivision four. And so, um, so that's, again, it's just a cross reference to our rape shield law. And I'm happy to talk, chat with you about all this offline for floor prep if you need anything. Okay, okay, the version I'm looking at, I think it's subdivision three. So maybe I'm not looking at the right version, which I- Oh, sorry, I might, be, I might be on the, sorry, I'm going back and forth and- I, It's okay, I can catch up with you. That, that's helpful, that's, I can, and I can just compare them. So thank you. Um, sorry, that's my fault. Yes, it's three in the Senate version. Um, so the next one is section four, sorry, uh, which is the Vermont Sentencing Commission. And this was to address the issue about whether or not the consent language in 3254 should still apply to lewd lascivious conduct in light of the General Assembly's change um, in creating kind of the misdemeanor version of LNL with prohibited conduct. And so they just want the Sentencing Commission to take a look and see whether or not that all makes sense still. Section five is the data collection and they did not change anything in that section. And so next I'm gonna move um, to the, the amendment for the council. And so on that, I'm just gonna hit the highlights. They made a lot of little small language changes, but I would say the primary ones are that um, they did add uh, an additional student, college student to the council. Um, they left, and so instead of two, there'll be three. Um, and then with regard to the duties of the, of the council, 
Um, they put up front and center kind of having the council follow up on the work of the task force. So looking at those recommendations of the task force and developing actionable solutions um, based on those recommendations. Um, and then they uh, tweaked a couple of the other duties there. They added um, a new one around um, identifying campus-wide activities, publications, and services that promote a campus culture of respect to support the prevention of sexual harm. And then there's one that's very specific, and that's in subdivision six. Uh, and this relates to one of the recommendations of the task force, um, which was um, to look at how to protect through, uh, through state statute um, students who uh, make sure that they're not punished for reporting an incident of sexual violence um, due to concerns about alcohol or drug use um, violations that might you know, be found um, if they did report that. So again, kind of similar to your good Sam law there. And so that was one of the recommendations of the task force that the Senate um, wanted the council to report on soon rather than waiting for their normal reporting period. And so they'd be required to come to you by November 1st of this year with some recommendations that you could develop into legislation. Um, uh, so the reporting, other than that November 1st, reporting uh, deadlines are the same. So it's on or before December 1st um, of next year and then annually thereafter they would be reporting to you with uh, recommended legislative action uh, ideas. Um, they did change the sunset um, and they shortened it by three years. So the, the House had a seven-year sunset and the Senate put in a four-year sunset. And so that's what's in section seven of the individual instance of amendment. Um, they did include the, the full appropriation that the House included um, for uh, staffing and for per diems and expenses. Um, they did take out the appropriation for the forensic nursing program because they already have it in the budget elsewhere and they confirmed that. So they didn't think it needed to be in here. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. Oh, Thank you. Um, Michelle, can you explain how it works when the Senate has a different sunset than the House? I don't know if I've ever encountered that. Uh, well, you would either be agreeing to it or, or not agreeing to it or... Oh, oh, okay. You're not saying... Okay. I thought you were saying... Never mind. I thought you were saying the bill was putting that the Senate had a different date, not that one house did one thing and the other chamber did the other. No, it's just you. Okay, all right. The, the house, sorry, the, the house version had a seven year sunset. Yeah, okay. And the person has a four, so they shortened the sunset in this Got it. I, I totally. That's okay. Okay, all right, ha happy we're, Monday. We're all doing a lot of things right now. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, Bob, I want to make sure. Do you do you have a question? Your hand has been up. I'm not sure if it was from before or. I do have a question. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, Michelle. Not that it's a big deal, but I just was trying to understand the rationale between adding a third student on there versus two. And is that the magic number? Or what were they? What was their rationale behind that? Um. So it's tricky trying to speak for the other body, but I think uh, so the, the house language, which is preserved in there as designated that the two students are representing certain kind of constituencies. So one student um, has to have lived experience with sexual harm and the other student has to uh, be representing, I think, a racial justice organization. And so the Senate wanted to add an additional student there without any kind of requirements as to who that student is because they wanted to, um, they did that around the idea about having some, a student being able to represent uh, students who might be accused of, uh, of uh, sexual harm and their perspectives, but they didn't want to necessarily designate that in the legislation, um, but they did talk about that, um, wanting to have a range of perspectives. And so they just thought that adding an additional student would be helpful. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, don't see any other hands. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. So I'm not seeing any other hands, so I will move on to our on to our witnesses. Unless Michelle, if you had anything else you wanted to add at this point, but you're good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'd like to stop by two fifteen because we do need to be on the floor at two thirty. So I want to give folks time to transition. Um, so if we could start with the Defender General's office, please, Rebecca Turner. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Rebecca Turner, appellate defender from the Office of the Defender Generals. Uh, so I have been before this committee to talk uh, about this bill uh, several times before, but I'll, I'll confine um, my uh, testimony this afternoon to connect specifically with the changes that the Senate uh, judiciary made. And, and I can also speak more uh, to Representative Norris's question about how the number of, of students changed from two to three, because I spoke on, on that issue um, before the committee. Um, and so going first, I just wanna stress yet again, my theme throughout uh, test, testifying on this bill, but certainly after the proposed changes that the Senate Judiciary made specifically defining consent and as Michelle Childs pulling from uh, another state's definition of consent into our own state's uh, definition exacerbates uh, the, the substantial concerns that I have made uh, clear with this committee. And that is that this is constituting a significant departure from our sexual assault state jurisprudence as that has developed through case law, through so many decisions, uh, not through, of course, amendment by this legislature to the statute, but as this case law has developed. One of the new angles, I'm not sure this committee heard, uh, and I'm not sure if David Schur is here today, but he spoke uh, before the Senate Judiciary to share as well that the criminal division of the AGO was also similarly concerned with the change proposed language in the statute. Again, our other side of the aisle, but confirming that the changes were sweeping and that there may be unintended consequences. So the question earlier this afternoon from uh, Chair Grad as to whether or not this would lower or burden the state's um, case for proving guilt after a charge, I think, uh, you know, again, David Schur can, can speak to what exactly the criminal division attorneys of AGO are concerned about. Certainly from my perspective, and, and there is confirms at least this much, this is a significant departure. We are importing these terms from another state. We do not know how this will be interpreted. And so this will open up um, plenty of litigation as we navigate, we, the attorneys on either side of the aisle, the judges interpreting these new, um, phrases, how they interact and, and, and mean, um, and how they are inconsistent or consistent with current case law. So I think to the extent that uh, this committee is, is charging towards uh, reforming um, this area of the law, I just want it to be understand clearly that it is significant change at all of a sudden. So again, I just wanted to reiterate our continued opposition to this bill. Moving to Representative Norris's uh, question about why three to uh, increase a three from two. Uh, there, it was about addressing on page three of the draft 1.1, page three lines one through two, there was the suggested additional language that, it, that uh, shows up here, which is that the council is reflective of Vermont college campuses. Um, and therefore the appointing authority shall consider diversity when making appointments to the council. And so my, my point in question to, um, to the committee that I, I asked what diversity meant, what was the type of diversity being sought uh, in terms of membership on this council? I pointed out that if diversity was beyond race, gender, age, 
but specifically going to the perspectives of the students themselves on Vermont campuses, uh, perspectives from both sides in terms of those who um, stand to be accused or those who come from families or friends, organizations that can share and voice those perspectives. I urged uh, the additional uh, voicing of that and that though the Defender General's office has a spot or a defense attorney's uh, spot on this council that certainly is a specialized uh, type of expertise and perspective being brought to the council, but certainly doesn't stand in for um, the pre-charge student voice themselves. Again, disproportionately that we know, anecdotally at least, is disproportionately black and brown uh, men and boys being accused. So I wanted to keep my statements brief, so I'll stop here unless there are further questions. Thank you. Um, just giving folks a chance to put their hands. Not seeing any, so thank you very much. Uh, State's Attorney Rory Tebow, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to join you today. So for the record, State's Attorney Rory Tebow of Washington County. I um, want to answer a few of the really big questions about the, the changes and maybe give a little context to why the Senate had some different considerations. Uh, from the get-go, I think the Senate adopted the Oklahoma standard of consent based upon a desire to have consent expressed in a more in more positive terms versus being stated in the negative. So Vermont does have a somewhat unique structure of having a general consent definition followed by the trial procedure section, which goes to detail what consent cannot be or what it cannot be proven by. Uh, so to that end, the adoption of the Oklahoma standard, I think, adds that necessary uh, clarity. And uh, I would what I would use is it sharpens the definition. The existing consent definition already contains the term voluntary. So adoption of the Oklahoma standard really amounts to an evolution or clarification of that Vermont standard by adding affirmative and unambiguous uh, to it. In terms of the question of does this raise the state's burden at trial, the answer is no. Uh, we're focused on proving a lack of consent, not the existence of consent. So as you provide a more refined definition, um, that doesn't necessarily change the burden, um, but it does uh, in terms of proving a lack of consent. If anything, it would tend to um, require a greater demonstration of acts or words that um, were either lacking or in the case of whether it was consent that there's something that satisfies that new definition. I, I was asked uh, by my department and some others to take a look at uh, Oklahoma and I have a few things I wanted to share with you. So Oklahoma adopted this definition in 2016. Many of you heard reference to a recent case in the state of Minnesota uh, where a uh, alcohol involved sexual assault was overturned by the Supreme Court. Very similar circumstances prompted um, the adoption of this standard in Oklahoma. Uh, so to that end, uh, it follows a pattern that we've seen in many other states around the country of uh, taking the last decade as the opportunity to reevaluate uh, definitions for consent and the sex assault statutes. Um, in terms of constitutionality, I did a review as well of case law on the new definition in the state of Oklahoma. To date, there has been no uh, challenge on a constitutional basis and case law surrounding sex assault has not focused on the definition of consent, rather other evidence or other circumstances particular to those cases. Uh, so that said, it doesn't appear that there are uh, significant constitutional concerns or any viable constitutional claim against that definition's adoption in that state. Uh, so having been on the books for now five years, I would have expected to see at least some of that. Uh, of course, Oklahoma has also gone through the same process Vermont will go through, which is to have their uh, respective committees uh, in the court process adopt uh, model jury instructions, among other things. Uh, I provided some of those uh, to other stakeholders uh, previously, and they're available online if anyone wants to, to take a look. Uh, finally, um, there are some, a few differences between Oklahoma statute and Vermont's. Uh, I think one of the most notable ones is Oklahoma states uh, whether there's a voluntary agreement to engage in specific sexual activity during a sexual encounter, Vermont limits that to a sexual act. I think this is part of the reason why the Senate elected to have the sentencing that should take a look at the applicability to lewd and lascivious conduct. And just for this committee's benefit, there was a broader discussion that 
uh, or at least I'd introduced in, um, into the discussion that it may be time or next session may be a good time to reevaluate our entire regimen of how we look at lewd and lascivious conduct. We ultimately in Vermont have adapted what used to be an offense against the public or a common law type offense into uh, what other states would call sexual battery or aggravated sexual contact or other things. So that this is the sort of unwanted sexual touching or groping uh, that doesn't result in penetration to meet our definition of a sexual act. Um, it also is the sort of strange construct that we use this offense against public disorder as a basis for what is a personal or victim-based crime. Uh, so the Senate asked, the Senate Judiciary Committee asked some really great questions about um, adaptation of this definition uh, to that. And then also uh, it seems collaterally the right time to then take a look at how those uh, statutes can be modernized as well to reflect um, that those are personal crimes, not just crimes against uh, the public or the community. Uh, Michelle also provided testimony on that point, and uh, I think could also give context if need be about the applicability of this definition to our existing LNL statutes, um, which it's effectively integrated there through the trial procedure, which covers not just sex assault, but LNL. So I hope that gives some context to the uh, changes in definitions. I'm uh, more than happy to answer any questions that the committee members have. Thank you. That was very helpful. Appreciate that. Uh, just looking for hands. Selena. Could you just say one more time, because it was really fast and I was writing and just the um, the difference in language between Oklahoma and the Oklahoma Consent Definition and what, what the Senate sent to us. Sure, and I apologize for speaking so fast. Uh, I'm, okay. Moving a, it's okay, I'm moving a mile a minute with uh, our resumption of jury trials in Washington County on Monday, so a lot of uh, on moving parts here in an exciting time. Um, but that said, Oklahoma's definition right now, and I'll just read from the part voluntary agreement onward, it states voluntary agreement to engage in a specific sexual activity during a sexual encounter, which may be revoked at any time. The definition that Vermont is proposing to adopt starts with voluntary agreement to engage in a sexual act, which may be revoked at any time. So I think the Oklahoma statute was written with a broader focus in mind, covering directly what we would include as LNL, meaning that a sexual activity can be something broader than a sexual act involving penetration. Um, so that, that nuance I think is reflective of just how the whole range of sex offenses are categorized under their statute and doesn't contribute to a different interpretation of overall consent. Thank you. That was super helpful. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Well, thank you so much, Rory. You've been working on this for a long time and appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sarah Robinson, to here. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, for the record, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Uh, thank you so much for taking testimony on the Senate proposal of amendment this afternoon. And I just wanted to note that we're um, deeply appreciative of the good work of the Senate Judiciary, Judiciary and Education Committees, as well as um, the work of this committee and the Committee on uh, House Committee on Government Operations, as this bill has wound its way through, through the process. So as Michelle laid out, uh, the most significant changes of note from our perspective are the modifications to the sexual assault, uh, definition of sexual assault that are found in section one. Um, and Rory, uh, State Attorney Thibault spoke to the uh, language from Oklahoma. We do believe, we agree that this language seems to offer an improvement to Vermont's current consent definition. And as noted, the language adds both affirmative and unambiguous to the voluntary language already present in Vermont's definition. And we especially appreciate that this new definition now highlights that consent can be revoked at any time. And the revocation concept is much more aligned with modern concepts of consent. Uh, so we certainly hope that this will allow cases with broader fact patterns, which really reflect the complexity of sexual violence to be considered when victims choose to report. 
Um, I did want to note that while we are very supportive of the Senate's amendment, uh, I feel an obligation to note for this committee, as we did to the Senate Judiciary Committee, that um, any changes to definition come with a certain level of caution. And we feel very heartened by the opinion of the state's attorney, legislative council, and others regarding um, the changes made by the Senate. But we do not know exactly how the language will be interpreted by Vermont courts um, and within the context of our case law. So while we fully support the language, we also certainly reserve the right to request that the legislature revisit this definition in the unlikely event that there are unanticipated consequences. Um, and we'll be sure to be monitoring that um, as the statute, if the statute is ultimately passed and signed by the governor, then we will certainly be monitoring um, how this plays out in the courts. The Senate also made some changes that you heard about to the Intercollegiate Council on Sexual Violence Prevention. Uh, we're very grateful for those changes. We fully support all of them. Um, including the slight modifications to the charge um, and certainly the direction to the council to look at what policy changes might be needed to ensure that people who report sexual violence do not face criminal or institutional discipline liabilities. So with that, I'll just say, again, we support the Senate's proposal, proposal of amendment, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that committee members have. Thank, thank you so much, Sarah. Barbara. Thanks. So, Sarah, I, I, I guess I'm wondering if, I mean, anytime there's a definition change, as you pointed out, it could be interpreted differently. But does this rise to like a higher level for you? And if so, like, are what are you? Can you speak more to what you're worried about? And if it's been, you know, if other states had that in the beginning, or or just how big a worry it is. Yeah, so I can say that um, we're not overly worried about it. Um, we actually do believe, we feel quite confident that this is going to be an improvement, um, that this definition is going to be an improvement in the statute. Um, but what I will say is just as the canon has kind of evolved across the country, as consent laws have evolved, uh, we do, as um, Attorney Turner and others have noted, you know, we do have a considerable amount of case law here in Vermont. Um, and certainly any changes to the statute will be considered within that broader context. Um, and so I wouldn't say that we're um, overly concerned at all, but I just feel an obligation to just note um, that anytime changes are made, that there is some level of risk. It is risk that we are very comfortable with um, and we feel very good about the language, um, but I do think it's just important to note. And I don't know if, um having professional education pre, you know, at the beginning of it makes sense, both for judges school or also for um, attorneys. And again, I don't know if that's been tried, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts about if, if something like that could at least have uh, an opportunity for greater understanding of I mean, hopefully the law is clear, but just in terms of uh, the changes. And again, I, I don't even know if that's a thing, but like, I'm just wondering. Yeah, I, I, that's a great suggestion. And I would say that that's something that we commonly do when new bills are um, passed, when existing law is changed, that we do very much try to reach out to the community of stakeholders, whether that is the bar, whether that's the judiciary, um, whether that's advocates to discuss the changes um, and potentially work together on any information that may need to be shared about the, the new changes. So we'll certainly be doing that over the summer. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for, for Sarah? Not, not seeing any. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. So that um, actually concludes our testimony on, on 183. Uh, my understanding is that the um, Attorney General's office is unable to uh, testify today. Uh, 
but my my understanding is that they do not have objections to the um, to the bill as it as it passed the the Senate. So, given that, I um, I would entertain a, a motion to concur with the Senate. Uh, I think that that the uh, combined House and Senate's work on, on this bill does meet the goals of the bill um, as it was introduced. It certainly modernizes our sexual assault laws. It addresses the concerns of impairment um, and alcohol, you know, the roles of alcohol and impairment, and certainly uh, puts a spotlight on our college campuses. Uh, certainly, uh, we, we will be following the um, the, the law, if, if enacted, uh, especially with the uh, trial practice sections of that, but other pieces as, as well. So I would uh, entertain a motion in a second, and then um, we will have discussion. Thank you. I'll, I'll move that we concur with the Senate's proposal of amendment. I'll Thank second. You. Great, thank you, Felicia. Any discussion? Uh, I, I would just say, appreciate the Senate's good work here. I'm really glad that they ultimately did choose to um, retain the, the intercollegiate council. I know that was something they, you know, went back and forth on and we're, we're really thinking about um, for a while. And it's, it's certainly very important to my district, to student survivors in my district, and I think to folks all around the state. So I was, I was really grateful to see that, call, that a version of this come back to us with, with a version <laughs> of the council still intact. Thank you. Any anybody else in terms of discussion? Ken, I'll just make a point. I think I think we've uh, improved this bill a lot, and um, and uh, hopefully it'll it'll uh, be a great start to uh, uh, for better protection for uh, people. That's how I feel about it. Great, thank you. Thank you, appreciate that, Ken. Anybody else? Tom. Thank you. Yeah, I was yeah, doing some light reading this weekend <laughs> on, uh, on, on this topic. And I don't remember what state it was. Or they may have covered a few different states, but just the, the uh, I don't know what's, what's the right word. The, the number of cases that come, rape cases that come forward, uh, you know, when there, when there's impairment involved is, is negligible. Um, and, uh, uh, the, the sample that, that they used, I don't remember how many potential cases they were talking about, but there was only two cases in, in, in an in a incredible number that were ever brought forward. And, and you know, there was a lot more that could have been. And, uh, you know, it's all, it was all because of, you know, in the different states, the prosecutors, you know, were, were reluctant, uh, you know, to, uh, to bring charges. And even if they did make it to court, you know, depending, uh, uh, judges were, uh, um, you know, we're reluctant as far as, you know, con you know, convicting of people or whatever. And, and it all had to do with one reason is because there was impairment or alcohol involved. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, with this new law, it's going to, um, you know, embolden some, uh, some victims to, uh, I don't know if the right word is emboldened, but, uh, you know, give them a, a enough comfort and, and uh, add a little courage where they will come forward. Um, you know, and do the right thing to protect themselves. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do appreciate the uh, Good Samaritan-like uh, language that the, that the Senate put in. I think, that's, I think that should be very, very helpful. Anybody else? Barbara. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm like slow at doing the buttons here. Um, so 
I, um, it's just so interesting to have different bodies look at it. And, you know, it, it definitely speaks to why diversity is important. Um, I think Representative Coburn made a good point about the um, Intercollegiate Council. And I think the points that Rebecca Turner made about um, having someone on the council on the other side makes sense. I wondered about young people who are not going to higher ed when we were talking about diversity, but nonetheless, um, I think we should concur and we'll vote for that. And as we monitor um, how this goes, I think we should be sensitive to Rebecca's points about um, disproportionate, um, just, just who is um, getting accused and are there um, unforeseen consequences that we should address even before uh, the sunset so that we can make sure we're threading that needle well. So um, yeah. So it's great to have like so much thought and then pause and then more thought. And yeah, so I'm happy to vote yes. Thank you, Selena. Um, yes, just to, to build on your point, Barbara, um, I think thinking back to the work of the previous sexual harm, campus sexual harm task force, which is now like this group is much more explicitly charged with really delving into those recommendations. Um, we, I'm glad that the um, Senate left that sort of thirds, the criteria for that third student pretty open because I think it, it was challenging to find folks to talk about their experience on the on the record as being a respondent, um, it's it's pretty sensitive and hard to come forward about that. We did we did actually have one member of the task force who shared experience both as a respondent and a claimant who'd been on both sides of the issue, and that was really illuminating. Um, one of the other things that the campus sexual harm task force report really talked about was data and the question of how bias might be playing into these adjudications and who you know, is sort of charged for lack of a better word in campus settings and what kind of outcomes they're receiving. And there actually is a very, some explicit recommendations in that report around data collection and trying to get around some of the challenges of data collection in such a small state in ways that still yield demographic data info. So I think that the new language from the Senate to um, explicitly pick up on those recommendations will actually be very helpful to that issue, I hope. Thank you. Anybody else? Then with that, Ken, do you have your, are you set to call the roll? Yeah, we are ready to go. Please, the clerk shall commence to call the roll. Christy? Colburn? Yes. Donnelly? Yes. Coastland? Yes. Lalonde? Yes. Leffler? Yes. Norris? Mr. Norris? Sorry about that, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Rachelson? Yes. Burdick? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Oh, Will thank Coach you. be back and I'll hold it? Yeah, please, let, let's hold it. Hopefully he'll, hopefully he'll be back. And again, I'm not sure if, if it will be on notice tomorrow and called off the notice calendar, but thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. So we are, we will be prepared. In terms of the rest of our agenda, uh, let's pick it up tomorrow at, at nine. As you see that so far, we don't have other committee meetings scheduled this week, just sort of playing it by, by year and see how far we, um, we go. 
uh, if anything comes up between um, now and when we go back on the floor, uh, floor at, I think, what, 4 or 4.30 and we need to address anything, um, I'll send an email or make an announcement on the floor when we go back now. Uh, but otherwise, we will not meet as a committee until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So thank you, everybody, and we can adjourn.